Good morning. Why don't you stand to your feet this morning? As the Spirit was moving over the water, Spirit, come move over us. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. As the Spirit was moving over the water, Spirit, come move over us. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. Come down. Spirit, when you move, you make my heart pound. When you feel the room, you're here and I know you are moving. I'm here and I know you will feel me come down. Spirit, when you move, you make my heart pound. When you feel the room, you're here and I know you are moving. I'm here and I know you will feel me. Make my heart pound When you feel the room You're here and I know 
I hope that's your prayer this morning. The Lord would come and fill us. Good morning. How's everybody doing today? Is everybody excited? Graduation is a week away. Um, and I'm so pumped for these seniors. Many of you guys might not know that um, this senior class was our very first group of youth when we started five years ago. Isn't that awesome? And I believe we're recognizing about 12 of those guys. See, that's just a good number. You know, Jesus had 12 disciples. We've got 12 seniors. You know, it kind of works out pretty good for us. Um, so uh, what we're going to do today, we're going to sing a few songs. Um, our youth guys, Brian and Michael, are going to present our youth with some gifts. Uh, we have some uh, autographed um uh, signed Bibles with the with their name on it. It's the Tony Evans study Bible that we're giving those guys because uh, I think it's very important for us to invest in the next generation. But before we get started, I know there's some people that you might not have seen for a while and, and you want to give them a hug or you want to give them a handshake, fist bump, all that kind of stuff. So if you guys will go ahead and do that um, and then we'll get started. Well, as you guys are making your way back to your seat, just got a couple announcements. Um, after this service, we are having a reception in the lobby. So please stay. I think we're having a taco bar and some cake. Also, on each one of the tables out there, you're going to see just kind of, uh, I think I saw one, one student's uh, kindergarten graduation picture, but some of the parents have put together just some, some things out in the lobby. But we also... Um, I don't know about you guys, but um, sometimes, in, especially when you go to become an adult and as you start to grow, these are some of these moments that sometimes you look back on. And, and there's some cards out there, and it says, Advice for a Graduating Senior. Now, I'll go ahead and tell you, there's a lot of wisdom in this room. And I think those guys, they might not appreciate it now, but I guarantee you they'll appreciate it at some point in their life. Just write them a little note of encouragement. Write them something that's kind of meaningful and put it in that basket. I think that would be kind of cool. And also, uh, next Saturday, there's going to be a student revival kind of to kick off the summer, okay? Um, it's at Round Lake Baptist Church. What is kind of cool, our worship band is going to team up and go down there and play. It's on a Saturday night at 6 o'clock, okay? And uh, our very own Tim Burns is going to be one of the guys that's speaking, so it's going to be kind of cool to kick off summer with some worship. And so I kind of wanted to build on that. Next Sunday, we're doing a worship morning, okay? So we're going to spend time in worship and prayer and just seeking God about what He's going to do in this congregation, in this church, in this community, and all the churches uh, for this summer. Because um, I'm going to go ahead and tell you, this summer, I don't think God's going to take a break. God's not going to be on vacation. I think we're going to see God move this summer. So let us pray for our service, and then we'll get started. Father God, I thank you and praise you. Um, this class of young men they, and young ladies, they just, you, they mean the world to me. Watching them grow from little middle schoolers playing in the old gym on Sunday nights to the young adults that they are now. Watching them grow as some of them got baptized, some of them have sought you, to see them worship you in spirit and truth, to see them, all the things that they've done on the athletic field and in their personal lives. And, and I pray, Father God, Lord, that something that we've done here, something that they've made a commitment to, will carry them all the days of their life. That they'll never take their eyes off of you. They'll always seek you. They'll always seek truth. And I pray, Father God, just a blessing over this senior class. I love them like my own little kids. 
And I thank you for them. I thank you for their faithfulness. And I thank you for their encouragement. And I thank you, Father God, that you died on the cross for us so that we can sing and worship you all the days of our lives. And all God's people said...
His mercy is enough His grace is sufficient So come if you're needing Forgiveness or healing His mercy is enough Oh and this is our hope The cross it has spoken Death is no more settle in our hearts. God, I pray for these seniors as they get ready to embark on this next phase of their lives that is exciting and intimidating. God, I pray you would let those words resonate in their minds and, and ring out to them. Even in moments when they aren't expecting it, God, that you would just remind them, yeah. you really love us. Yeah. God, just bless the rest of our service. Um, 
We want it to be a blessing to you and to each other. So Holy Spirit, we give you free reign to do as you please in this service. And we just offer up our our time, our hearts, our talents, our, our resources, everything, God, for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. be seated. Am I good? All right. Well, good morning, everyone. You ready to celebrate some pretty awesome kids this morning? All right. Um, As TJ was saying, my name's Brian, and I've had the privilege to uh, serve with the youth here since the church started, and so it is just an awesome morning to be able to see um, some of these young people that we've watched grow up through middle school and uh, just make decisions for Christ, um, pursue their dreams, and just to see the strong young people they become. So what we're going to do is we're going to um, call you up one by one. Um, we're going to tell, tell you, all of you a little bit about them, and you're going to get a gift from uh, TJ and Michael, and then I ask you to stay up here so we can get a, a picture to follow. So... All right, first up, we have Mr. Dylan Randall Height. Come on down. (laughs) Dylan is the son of Mitch and Jessica Height. He's graduating from Watertown High School. Um, His school activities have included tennis, cross country, FCA, the Explorers program through Mount Juliet Police Department. His plans after high school are to attend school to be a police officer and to play tennis. Give it up for Dylan. All right, next we have Mr. Brody Wayne Parsley. Son of Tony and Whitney Parsley. Um, Brody is graduating from Watertown High School. His school activities have been FFA, the fishing team, and wrestling. And his plans after high school are to attend TCAT in the fall to study automotive technology. Congratulations. All right, next we have Brooke Allison Monroe. Get up for Brooke. Daughter of Aaron and Elizabeth Monroe. And uh, she is graduating from Watertown High School as well. And her plans after school are to attend cosmetology school and become a beautician. All right, next we have Mr. Jaden Michael Robertson. Son of uh, Michael and Christina Robertson. Uh, Jaden will be graduating from Watertown High School as well. His school activities have been football. Uh, All four years, he received uh, all district, all regional, and all state. Pretty awesome. Um, His plans after school were to attend Cumberland University on a football scholarship. Congratulations. Next, we have Miss Hannah Elizabeth Pearson. (laughs) Daughter of Troy and April Pearson. Troy, sorry, Trey. It's it's type Troy, sorry. (laughs) Graduating from Watertown High School. School activities have included reading and hanging out with Liam. Plans after high school is to attend Paul Mitchell. Congratulations, Sam. Next, Mr. Liam David O'Connor. Son of Jessica and David O'Connor, graduating from Watertown High School. His school activities have been soccer, football, beta club, the National Honor Society, I don't know what that is, <laughs> and he is graduating with honors. 
Uh, plans after high school are to attend the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga with a biology major. All right, next up we got Mr. Caleb Matthew Clement. Son of Matthew and Marie Clement, graduating from Watertown High School. School activities have been soccer, beta club, and the National Honor Society. Plans after high school are to attend Cumberland University and to obtain an associate's degree in business. Congratulations, Caleb. All right, next we have Mr. Zachary Wayne Adams. Now we actually have a Troy, son of Troy and Jeannie Adams. He's graduating from Watertown High School. School activities include graduating with honors, football, and amateur autocross. That's pretty sweet. Plans after high school are to attend Vol State Community College, majoring in logistics and supply chain management. All right, next we have Miss Gabrielle Christelle Riley. Honoring with her are her parents, Brad and Amanda Riley, and Miss Isabella Young. She's graduating from Watertown High School. School activities have included basketball manager, beta club, and FFA. Plans after high school are to attend college. Congratulations, Gabby. And last but not least, we have Mr. Braden Anthony Cousineau. Mom, Brandy Cousineau, graduating from Watertown High School. School activities have included baseball, football, FCA, Beta Club, Mr. WCS, wow, and All-State in football. Plans after high school are to play baseball or a career in welding. Let's give it up. All right, y'all want to pose for the picture here? I'm out. Big smiles. Let's give them all one more round of applause. Hey, graduates, don't go away. You guys don't go away. Real quick, if you just turn around, if you turn around and face me, as you guys head out right now, this is certainly a graduate recognition service where we want to clap and we're going to go out there and have a huge party, and that's all through the New Testament. You can find that all through the New Testament. But today our church also wants to commission you to what this next phase of life is for you. Because you're, gonna, you're not going to enter a world where there's all these opposing worldviews. You're already in it. But it is certainly a next phase. And what we want to say to you is, first off, Godspeed. We want you to go with God um, as you head out of here. And to remember for the folks that I've only been here less than a year. Some of you I know better than others, but there are a host of folks that are right here waiting for a phone call from you um, if you need them. No matter what that is, what the need is, they're right here. So we just want to pray a prayer of commissioning over you and just to say um, that we're proud of you and the future looks bright because of you. Let's pray together. Father, we pray for this group right now as they are poised to take this next leg of the journey that so many of us have taken. But this one is special because it's theirs. It's the time that they're entering the world. And God, with all that is beset around us to, to steer us from you and to get us off course, God, we would pray right now that those things would not be aligned with the path that these young men and women find themselves on. Father, that their eyes can be laser focused on the cross and that the, the, the sacrifice of your son Jesus will drive every decision and every action that they take. God, I pray that, um, as you tell us in your word, that they would trust in you with all their heart, that they would lean not to their own understanding, but in all their ways they would acknowledge you. And the promise is that you will direct their paths if they do that, Father. That they would seek first your kingdom 
and righteousness, and all things will be added to them. God, we pray and believe that over them this morning, and we give them to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. One more big hand for these guys, please. If you have your Bibles, sorry, Tony, I don't know why I'm, apparently I'm a mouth breather uh, on this thing, jacking me up, I'm sorry. If you have your Bibles, if you'll turn to Matthew 28, uh, I think we're going to get there. If you're visiting with us, let me just say welcome to worship. Um, This is an odd day to be here because you might be thinking, well, if he's going to just be talking about stuff for graduates, that really isn't going to impact me. There's nothing that's going to be there for me. And I would think that 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 would be a fair assumption. It'd be like coming on Mother's Day and you're a guy and you're like, hey, what's going on? Well, last week I I was moved by what these ladies had to say up here. And what I think you're going to find is that we're going to talk about something today that impacts all of us. And I think I entitled this message, Jesus Said Go, I think is what, uh, where I landed. I can't remember, but it's something in that, in that ballpark. And uh, what I want to focus on this morning is uh, the last things that Jesus said before he left. How many of you live in a family where you are, before you head out the door, when you're going uh, to leave and to part ways to start the day, you're a I love you, I love you too family. Raise your hand big and high, let's see it. That ain't everybody's thing, but it's a lot of people's thing. Or if you maybe on the phone, you're going to say that. Do you know why we wait and say that at the end? Because it's the most important thing. Of everything else that's happened, you want this person to know that they are leaving with your love today. It's the most important thing. So it stands to reason that the last thing Jesus said before he left is something that we might want to key in on, something that we might want to focus on. And, and you might say, well, man, I, I, there's, there's a lot that he said. Are you talking about the last thing he said is, is it is finished? Well, he did say that. That was the last thing he said on the cross, but it's not the last thing he said to his people before he went back. If you're looking at Matthew 28, we're going to get to one of those, that last thing that he said, but we can't do it without thinking about all the stuff that's happened in Matthew 27. Matthew 27, if you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, Matthew 27 is one of the most difficult passages of Scripture to have to stomach. Because it, it speaks all about Christ's suffering on the cross. In this chapter, I've just, in my notes, put a few things. Jesus is delivered to Pilate, the guy who's deciding Jesus' fate. Judas, the disciple who betrays Jesus, hangs himself. Pilate offers the angry crowd a choice between Jesus uh, and a known criminal, and they choose the criminal. Jesus is mocked. He's spit on. And he's got a crown of thorns on his head. He's crucified. He dies. A rich man named Joseph asks for Jesus' lifeless body and offers his own tomb for the burial. And and knowing Jesus' followers said that he would rise from the dead, guards are posted at his tomb. All of that happens in Matthew 27. It's a lot of stuff going on. And again, one of the most heart-wrenching chapters of the Bible. But then Jesus conquers the grave. It's the culmination of our faith. And and it's hard to absorb that without appreciating Matthew 27. So a few days later, when Mary does come to the tomb, there's this earthquake. The angel of the Lord has come down, rolls this huge stone away, and he tells her that that he is risen. And they they just, they start running. They got to go tell people all about this. They're they're not casually walking. They're not like, hey, this this is the deal. Up to this point, they really didn't have a good grasp on what was about to happen with Jesus. They really didn't know, was he going to come out of that grave? They didn't really have this this understanding. And all of this is about to just solidify into the foundation of our very faith. And let's pick this up in, um, this is in verse 9, I think, of Matthew 28. Just then Jesus met them and said, good morning. They came up, took hold of his feet, and worshipped here, and worshipped him. Now we can't camp out too long right here, but what they are not saying is, ah man, it is so good to see you again. I haven't seen you for three days. That's not what's going on here. They're so moved by what's going on that their only response is to fall down and just to be low and worshipful before him. They worshiped him. And he says to him, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to leave for Galilee, uh, to leave for Galilee and they will see me there. And all that is beautiful. And again, uh, it's why we celebrated Easter Uh, several weeks ago, but that's not the last thing that Jesus said to them. 
The 11 disciples head to Galilee. They see Jesus there. And this is what he says to them in Matthew 28, 19 and 20, also known as the Great Commission. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority is uh, in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. Uh, I have a history with this passage because I learned it when I was about nine years old. Is anybody in here, uh, if you can't, grew up as a Baptist and you're an older person and uh, at least older than me, do you remember training union? Did anybody remember training union? There's one, two, three, four, five, six, please. I mean, this is a serious deal. This is an old, old, old thing, training union. And I mean, I'm a little bitty kid going and Randall and Malia Oakley, had a had a training union class and what they would do is we would just learn scripture in there and I'm a product of Bible drill and all this other kind of stuff that a lot of churches don't do anymore and man they would just have us memorize the scripture and there are verses that are in my head that I know that are just because this dedicated couple said hey we're going to teach you guys this and this is one of them that we learned Matthew 28 19 and 20 and whenever I learned that, actually, training union turned into discipleship training, which turned into some, something else after that. But we, we can talk about that at lunch that you'll buy me one day, or that'll be fine. But I memorized this in the King James Version. And in that translation, uh, I can't remember what, what is up there. It, does, it says, go ye therefore and teach all nations, I think, is what, it, is what it says in the King James. But I think that the better translation of that, from what I have read since my youth, is that the translation is actually go make disciples. That Jesus is saying to them, go and make disciples. It's a translation that, that I didn't read until later in life. And I didn't take this guy, when I read this the first time, I didn't take him at his word. I've got Bible software. I started reaching, uh, researching this. And the better translation certainly is make disciples. And I thought through that. Because if, if the church has done its job here and if parents have done their jobs what we're sending out is, I think there are 11 students down here, 11 graduates. Um, they should have, at this point in their lives, been well discipled by their, their folks and by this body. That is the responsibility of ours in Scripture. Um, this should be something that we're, we're excited to send them out. It doesn't, it's not super clean in, in this sense, but it is for the family. And what I mean by that is, when I read this passage... Uh, my son was about nine years old whenever I, I kind of came through all this, and I was already laser focused on his discipleship and trying to make sure that, that I was setting for him the foundation he would need to face the world. But I didn't know what that looked like outside of my, my personal family, if you will. I was on staff at a church at the time, and it's kind of an aha to ask a staff member who is dedicated. My, my whole job was working with students day in and day out. And I asked myself, have I made disciples? That is a hard question to ask oneself if you are truly interested in the answer. If you want to answer in the affirmative, that's a hard question to ask yourself. At that time, I had to say no. I'd graduated tons of students through my, my ministry. Um, I'd been a Christian since 1982, and I didn't feel like that I had set on a path of really churning out young, little Christ followers, if you will, or meeting somebody older in life and saying, hey, man, um, there's this cat named Jesus uh, that I know, who I know, and I would love to talk to you about him, introduce you to him, and teach you how I talk to him and how he talks to me. I couldn't say that I had laid that out. I, I went through this. I first preached this message in 2016, and I went through this again and thought uh, as I was preparing, could I answer that question in the affirmative today? So if I ask myself, has Michael Eubanks ever made a disciple? The best answer I can get is maybe. I'm investing in people. Um, there are people at my job who I know do not know Christ, and I talk to them about this stuff. But have I made a disciple yet? I think the answer is maybe. I don't know. 
So why, why is this important? Why do, why do I feel like I'm coming up short here? I want to build this watch for you as quickly as I can. If we look back in the Old Testament, when Moses was leading the children of Israel out of bondage, things got really busy. And so in fact, it was so busy that, that uh, Moses' father-in-law, Jethro, came to him and he said, Moses, you're doing too much. You need to share the burden. And he broke all the people up. I think you can find this in the book of Numbers, where he broke them up in thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. And he said, teach them the statutes and the law so that they can share in your responsibilities. Um, Maybe it's in Exodus. uh, Exodus, right, uh, 15 to 18, somewhere around in there. But he's basically giving them a framework for how to do this. And if you guys remember a few weeks ago, I talked to you about the Shema and that whole thing in Deuteronomy 6 where uh, Moses is reading to the people and he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and teach this to your kids as you're going, as you're le- uh, uh, coming back home in your daily life and everything you're doing, talk about this to your children. Imprint it on them so that they know it and they own it and they love it. That's the, the summation of the Shema. That's what Moses is trying to do here. And he's setting the context for discipling the family of his leaders. He's duplicating himself. He's replicating himself to, um, to his leaders and to their children. And it's not a selfish thing. And you can say, did Moses make disciples? This is long before the Great Commission. Long before it. Did Moses make disciples or did what he was doing work? Well, let's take a look at, at Joshua. And I, you don't have to, we're going to be all over the Bible, so you don't have to flip back and forth. I think I've got most of it on the screen. Take a look at Joshua 1, 1 through 2. For those of you who may not know, Joshua is the guy who followed Moses. Moses didn't get to go into the promised land, but Joshua is the guy that came in there, marched around Jericho seven times, the walls fell. That's that dude. Joshua 1, 1 through 2 says, After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord uh, said to Joshua, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' assistant, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore... Arise, go over this Jordan, you and all his people, into the land that I am giving you to the people of Israel. As a result of of Moses preparing when he would go, Joshua leads the people of Israel into the promised land. And when they got there, everything wasn't really cool. It wasn't just like, okay, we're going to drop right in here and, and everything is fine. Because there's no record that Joshua kept doing what Moses had been doing. There's no record that that Joshua said, I'm going to be pouring into people. I'm going to be doing this as well. And it seems to be clear in Scripture, and this, I'm really trying to go fast just for the sake of time, and you may be thinking I'm stretching this a little bit, but if you look in the book of Judges, it doesn't look like when, when Joshua, when Moses died and Joshua was ushered in as the leader, it doesn't look like the era passed after Joshua worked out so great. Listen to what Judges said about Joshua when he died. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110 years. Listen to this. And there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord or the work that he had done for Israel. So you've got Moses saying to the people, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Teach this to your kids. Do this over and over and over. Let them see it in everything. We know that Joshua was the guy who followed Moses. But some stuff happened, even though he saw all these great things happen in God's name, after he died, there's a whole generation of people who do not know the Lord. Now, you could look at Moses' uh, era, if you will, and say, well, hey, there's this funky stuff going on in the wilderness. It's, wilderness. it's not like the children of Israel batting a thousand anyway. You're right. But this gets called out in Scripture to a point where we've got to say, man, were, were they being obedient to what God had called them to do? So what about adults? I mean, what do we, how do we do this in this arena? And, and I was all over the board with what to share today just because, uh, man, I read a book for today, uh, The Reason for God by Timothy Keller, because I'm thinking these guys are, are coming out, they're going into all these opposing worldviews. And when you hear things like, can God really be trusted? Can the Bible be trusted? Can, um, is, it, uh, is it true? What about all the suffering? What about all of it? You know, just fill in whatever question is there. I have found solid, good, worthy answers to those questions in reading. And so they don't, they don't scare me off. I, I want to sit down with somebody and, and have a coffee and talk about them. But when you've come up in the church, there's times where, sorry, there's times whenever you could say, man, I hear this question and I know that this is real. I know that this is something I need to be talking about. 
but I can't reach back on the why that I believe that. It, it, it's difficult to be in that spot. Where I landed in this ultimately was, man, if we're going to fulfill the Great Commission, we got to go out and make disciples. When you look at the Bible, you can use several methods to, uh, to interpret it, but I think one of the best is just to allow the Bible to speak um, about itself. And so we've read the Great Commission from Matthew 28. I want to take, uh, take you to Timothy, to his second letter. Paul's in prison when he writes this to Timothy. Um, is a young disciple who's in Ephesus. And Paul is very personal with him, almost as if he's not sure that he'll ever see him again. Paul knows that death is imminent at this point. And he says to Timothy uh, this in 2 Timothy 2, 2. I think I've got it up. I'm going to read it from here. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. We meet for a men's group on Monday night over at Brad Whited's place. And man, there's got a lot, there has to be a lot going on in my life for me to miss that. Um, I long for it. I crave it. Um, I want these men leaning into my business and I want to be leaning in to theirs. And whenever we were meeting not too long ago, right before uh, Brad's son went off to college, we were praying over him and what he was going to do. Brad comes back to the group um, a few weeks later and says, man, Caleb has started this Bible study down at his, his school. And man, my heart about beat out of my chest. I, I was excited that Caleb had decided to do that. I wanted to pray for him right then, which is exactly what we did. What I also knew is what comes with that. When you risk for God's kingdom, sometimes it can feel like it's hard to get out of your own way. That, it, that at that point, whenever you're saying, hey, I'm going to do this for the Lord, all of a sudden you take this huge magnifying glass and let's say that this is your life. It's just like, Poof! and everybody's peering in at the good, the bad, the dark, the whatever. So you want to be over here on a college campus and you're saying, hey, man, I believe in this and I want us to study and read God's word. I want to do this. What I have heard in the presence of many witnesses, I want to entrust this to faithful men who will be able to teach that's where I saw Caleb. He's the guy who's going to teach. He's a faithful man that's been entrusted with this stuff. And I'm going to tell you, the reason my heart was beating out of my chest that night is because I was thinking what he was going to have to endure to fulfill that calling. All the pounding he was going to have to take for that. And it makes it where you just say, man, it'd just be easier. I just kind of kick back here in the shadows and I don't have to deal with that. I'll tell you this, men, we don't have that luxury. God has called us to do this. He's commanded us to do this. We have to lean in. We have to lean in like Caleb leaned in. Listen to this in Luke. This is um, in Luke chapter 6, 12, 13. In these days, he went out to the mountain to pray, and all night he continued in prayer to God. And when day came, he called his disciples and chose from them uh, 12 that he named apostles. Now, I tell you, this is an interesting time for Jesus, be, uh, I mean, in Jesus' ministry to me, because when I look at what he did, he interacted, he actually taught thousands of people. I'm going to say he interacted on a personal level with hundreds. I don't know if that number's in the thousands or not. But he did life with 12 and he poured into three. So you take this, this, this big, vast expanse of Christ's ministry to these thousands of people who are impacted what he said in that time. You narrow that down to the people who got to just see him, or maybe they had a conversation with him as he was passing by. Then there were 12 men who he said, I really want to do life with you. But there are three who got to see all the inside and out of Jesus the man. Men, I think that's what we're called to do. Ladies, I think that's what you're called to do. Teenagers, I think that's what you're called to do. If you sit here as a student um, and you say, well, man, I'm not really to that point yet of maturity. If you said yes to Christ, it's time to say, hey, what does he want me to do? Well, the last thing he said was, go therefore and make disciples. Baptize them in the name of, my father, of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. This is what he wants us to be doing. I feel like that in, 
in the church life, or at least in my life, I'm fulfilling the call that God has on my life. As a, a young person, I really felt like God was calling me into full-time ministry. And um, for a long time, the only way that I thought that I could serve him was to have a job at a church. And back in 2017, um, that plan clearly changed for me where I was 20 years invested to a body that I had given the best years of my life. And and loved people through the good and the bad. And when it, when it became clear, I didn't know what was next. I just know it wasn't there. I didn't know what God wanted for me. And um, I'm sitting, having dinner with this guy who ended up hiring me, uh, who was a church member. And I said, man, I don't know what's next. When I got to the other side of that, being able to live life as a guy that just goes to work every day and to be a disciple in God's kingdom, my identity had to kind of get rewired a little bit. And what, what, I'm, what I'm doing a really bad job of saying is that that full-time church vocational ministry, I believe that there are people who are called to that 100%. God may call some of you to that, may call me back to it. I don't know what the next five years, five years has or the next 15. But none of us could sit in a spot and say, well, you know what? Just because I don't work at the church doesn't mean that God has not called me to make disciples. It's not the church's job. It's the church's job with a capital C, um, but it's not the church's um, minister's job to do that. It's their job to equip the saints to go and do that. And so I'm just I'm trying to be transparent with you and say, man, God had to rewire me a little bit and figure out what this looked like. You know the worst part about working at a church? You hang out with saved people all the time. You got to really go out there to meet the sinners, right? I'm just, I mean, the sinners are all in the church. Don't, don't twist that up theologically. But I started going and, and meeting these people at my job. Let me tell you what I do. Uh, I represent an electrical manufacturer. I'm an electrical manufacturer's rep. When I was hired, the guy said, here's what I need you to do. I need you to listen to people, and I need you to talk to people. I was like, bro, talking is one of my favorite things to do. I'm good. I am your guy. What I found, I don't know what I expected. I'd worked in corporate America years ago for Dell and for Cracker Barrel's corporate office. I don't know what I expected my 20 years out of that when I came back in. But when I leaned back into that thing, I began to find people who were chasing after God who were electrical engineers, who were electrical contractors, who were electrical distributors. And I found myself in the unique position, I mean, I'm selling stuff. All right, I'm trying to peddle my wares here, as it were. And as I'm sitting down with them, I don't want to do something that's going to make this conversation not go well for me financially. I've put all that on the back burner. It's become easier for me to say to somebody, as the conversations will turn toward their families and what their kids are doing, one word that I've, one little phrase I've been able to come up with that has kind of allowed the ice to be broken is, hey man, are you a person of faith? I can't tell you the amount of times I've asked, I've asked that question, um, probably 50-50 where people just kind of demur the question. They just kind of set it aside and they don't want to focus on it. I've had other people that say, that say yes. Now look, just because they're people of faith, that don't mean they're Christians, right? So you, you don't know what you're getting. You, know, you're, you roll the dice. Are you a person of faith? Yes, I am. I'm going to roll them again then. <sighs> Tell me about it. And I try to look for a way to connect all the stuff they just told me about their kids to their faith. And I'm, I'm it's not an arrogant thing. It's, it's really humbling to say that, that over the past few years of working at this company, that there are now people I have regular interaction with. And when we go out for a business lunch, that whenever we get ready to um, have the meal together, uh, it's a chance for me to pray for them. So the food comes, sits down. You may not be a, a blessing out in public kind of person. Uh, I just 
I, I don't know what era, when else I'll have an opportunity to pray for those guys. And I just say, hey, man, let me pray for our meal real quick. And in that, I pray for them and I pray for their families and pray for what they're doing. I don't know if that's discipleship, but it's fostering this time of, of energy and connection and discussion that would not normally be, be there. And there are other people who are looking for that as well. So that's just one example how, how I do that, how I kind of approach this. Here's some ways that you can do this that are practical um, if you're interested if you're interested in following this thing that Jesus said when he said go. First thing is that this thing begins in your home. Uh, I'm just going to tell you, if you've got kids, I don't care if they are five or if they are 50, I'd be discipling my child. You've got to find a way to do that. Um, You've got to do it in a way that doesn't look like mine because I always want to sit down and have a 30-minute conversation about some life thing and that don't fly well with a 15-year-old. Um, he listens. He tolerates. Who tell you what, he won't get mad if I tell you this. So I'm sitting here driving down the road, right, having this mindset of what this conversation looks like. And you guys know what it looks like from my side, right? Here's him over here. Here's me, heart pounding. I got to talk to him about this. Yeah, he's, he, he's 10 miles away, you know. I don't know what he's into with his phone. I said, hey, dude. I need to talk to you. So when you get to a stopping point in that conversation, I need you to put your phone down. If I'm going to have a a substantive conversation with my son, I don't start with, would you put that phone down listen to me? I will not let Christ's message be, be painted by my bad attitude toward this phone. And you can't either. So, hey dude, when it gets to a good time, you know why that's important to me? Because whatever he's into is important to him right then. And I'm not going to shortchange that for him. So find a way to disciple your child. Find a way to ease into those conversations. Man, if he just, if your kid just flunked a test, if, if, if something just, maybe something bad with his girlfriend or with her boyfriend or, or whatever it is, find a way to talk about that. Um, that points back to, Hey man, this is what I do when I'm feeling this. And I tell you, man, if you don't have a good answer for that, if you, if, when you're struggling with all that life's throwing at you, if your knees aren't your first place you're going, it's going to be hard to tell your child to do that. So discipleship and uh, discipling your child is going to foster uh, spiritual disciplines in your own life. If you're practicing a sport, music, theater, academics, if you're seeking colleges, if you're asking your kids to be intentional on all those things, but you are not intentionally taking a role in their spiritual lives, you are not fulfilling the Great Commission in your home. If you're pushing them toward all of this success, but you're not taking a role in their spiritual lives, you are not fulfilling the Great Commission in your home. It's our primary role as parents. And men, I got to tell you, it's on us. I don't know what your household looks like. Uh, My household has one parent in it right now. When Carver's at his mom's, that household has one parent. So discipleship happens in in both of those places in some fashion. So if you're a two-parent home, men, it's your responsibility. Ladies, if you're on your own, when your child is at your place for that week or for those days or that weekend or whatever it is, it's on like Donkey Kong. This has to happen. Second, you got to get into a group that's not just an ongoing Bible study. I go to Brad's every Monday and meet. I love it. But there are about four guys that I do life with almost on a weekly basis that's way different from Brad's. It's something where we just get together and it's just us. Right now, I say there's probably 130 people, and here's going to be my guess. And if I said something right now, I would have zero amount of trust. If I said something that I didn't want to go past this room, granted it's not fair because this is streaming on the Internet, right? But if I didn't want it to go past this room, I would have zero amount of trust that that would happen because of the large amount of people. We go over to Brad's house. The, the number decreases and the trust increases, right? It's just me or a few guys hanging out over at the Mexican restaurant over here. The number decreases and the trust increases. If it's just me and Wade sitting knee to knee at a table over at Chili's like we've done before, 
The number decreases, but the trust increases. You got to have those people in your life. You got to find somebody that you can unpack this stuff with that's not in a big group. And man, if you want to read and memorize scripture together, um, there, there's so many ways that, that you can jump in and say, man, this is how I want to chase after this in my life. Last thing is that the cycle starts over again. And what do you mean by that? Well, the cycle with my son, I don't look at discipleship with him as it, that it's ever going to end, but it's certainly going to cycle in phases. I think I may have told you guys that I, I did a manhood thing for him when he turned 13 years old where uh, I had people come out and talk to him. I'll do another one when he's 16. I'll do another one when he's 18. I'll do one when he's 21. I'll do one when he gets married. There'll be specific times that we will... Um, that I'll say, son, excuse me, I'll say, son, you don't have to listen to this right now, but I've been where you are. This is how it worked out for me. I'll pray for him. I'll find things that God wrote in his word or had inspired to be written in his word. That will speak to what he's facing. And I'll share it with him. Map that out with your kids. Make it a priority. And just know that the cycle is going to start over. He's going to be a different guy at 21 than he is today. So it's going to cycle. If you've picked out some people that you're investing in and you're saying, hey, um, man, what does this look like when we walk through this journey? We've read and we've memorized scripture for a year, for two years, for three years. Well, it starts over with somebody else. And hopefully the three you've been meeting with go get three more. And they meet with somebody. The whole thing just cycles and it circles back around to right where we started. I, I don't know what you get from that today, <clears throat> from this time, but here's what, what I would like to offer you, to you as a time of response as we're singing this last song. Um, if you've never said yes to Jesus, or if you're not even sure what that means, there's a lot of people here would love to have a conversation with you. TJ's in the back. Brian's here, I'm here, whomever. Before you jet out the door, this would be such a low-key day to do that because we're going to be shoving our face full of tacos back there. You could have a really easy conversation. Say, man, that dude that was up there, I've got no idea what he talked about when he said, have you said yes to Jesus? Ask what that means. Somebody would love to tell you that. Second, if you've got a... If you've got a need in your life that, that you'd like somebody to pray for you, maybe it's spiritual, maybe it's physical, maybe it's emotional, man, I tell you, um, when life is putting you through the ringer and God, you seniors, I hope you latch on to this. We're not built to do that alone. just not built to do it alone if you have a need that's in your life and you're carrying it by yourself I can assure you that that burden is best carried with people who love and trust that who you love and trust to carry it with you unload that junk on them and let them start walking it with you there's no way this amount of people get together and people in the room are not going through bad horrible horrific stuff coming off one of the worst seasons of my life, man. A lot, of, a lot of times I thought, man, it can't get any worse than this, and it did. But that season's come to a close. And there's... I, 
can't tell you the amount of times through all of that that um, joy came in the morning. And man, it was... It was certainly because um, Jesus didn't leave me camped out there alone. There's always somebody that I could say, hey, this, here's this, here's this, this is where I'm at today. I mean, I could envision myself in a, in a room full of Bibles of God's Word and just picking them up and shoving them down and just saying, based on what I'm going through, I can't buy into that. Man, thank God I never got there. That was never my spirit. But I see how folks get there. Don't be one of them. Find somebody who will walk through it with you. That will get on their knees with you. So if that's you this morning, it's a real easy time to do that because there's all this fellowship going on in the back. And you could just pull somebody aside and say, I'm struggling with this. You are not built to carry that alone. It will destroy you. And lastly, for those of you who would say, look, I want to lead my family. I want to disciple them. I don't know what that looks like. I would think it would be easy to listen to some of the things that I have said and say, golly, man, I I don't know how he thought about that or whatever. Um, Man, I have read and read and read and listened and listened and listened, and it's just because I'm weird. I know everybody's not built like that, but I just like to learn. And I get laser focused on something and I just chase it down. If you want to do this, you just fall into it. You just start doing something. God's going to honor that prayer. He's going to teach you. He's going to show you. He's going to give you the words when you don't have them. If you want him to do that for you, if you want to take discipleship in your house to something different. I just I just want to open the, the altar up to you. If you want to come and pray, that's fine. You don't have to do that. Just pray at your seat. But it's the last thing that Jesus said. It's the most important. <clears throat> he wants you to do it. Let me pray for us and Wade will lead us. Father, I, I was all over the board today. I couldn't focus on these notes. Um... My prayer is that your message of what you say is important and holy and righteous and glorious and good came through these words today. That what we hear is a higher calling than the things that we normally chase after. And that we prepare so that when we reach days like this, an 18-year-old step into that next phase, that they are well prepared for it. God, we want them to do well. All the things out there on those tables, man, they are beautiful to look at and to celebrate. But I pray that every one of them is second to their relationship with you. That when they get that right, all this other stuff shakes out. It's not always pretty. It's not always without error. It's not always without pain. It's not always without suffering. God, I'll be the first to say, I do not get your timing sometimes, but I've learned to trust. And even when I don't see it, you're always right on time. So I pray that over my brothers and sisters. I pray that you have this time this morning and use it as you would in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand? Worthy of every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring 
worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever see. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever bring. We live for you. Oh, Jesus. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever see. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. We sing holy. There is no one like you. There is none beside.
so proud of these guys. Um, Michael did a good job, didn't he? Give it up for Michael. I know that was hard for him, but there's probably a reason why I didn't preach today. Um, I, I wouldn't have made it through. Um, this senior class, when they were in middle school, is the only reason why I'm on this stage. Seeing that group of kids is the only reason why I went back into coaching. Is the only reason why I went into preaching is because of this senior class. Because I saw a hope in the future in this group. A big hope of what they could bring, not only to the school, but to the community. And, and I wanted to be a part of their lives. And so I thank you guys. Thank you. And I love you. I truly love you. Some of my own kids. When I think back to the knuckleheads at Atoma in eighth grade, to the the camps on the Ocoee flipping boats and sinking canoes. To the guys that go to Passion Camp and all of the little worship services that we've been to and seeing you guys get baptized on Easter and get baptized at the aftermath of camp and, and watching you guys grow into the young women and men that you are today gives me hope. That the next generation of the church, of Water's Edge, of the church throughout the United States, is in good hands with these groups of guys. So I thank you for that. So can we give it a round of applause for these guys? So I got a couple of things. Uh, give it up for Miss Marie Clement for helping put all this together. All right, such an awesome job. So. Seniors, uh, I'm asking for you guys to leave first, okay? So if you guys will go out there and leave first, they want to take some pictures out there. Um, we have a cake, we have a taco bar, all that kind of stuff. Everyone else, um, as uh, we go, make sure to go pick up your kids and thank those guys that were out there wrestling your kids during this hour and 15 worship service. They've done an awesome job.